Hello and welcome to part number six of the 100 Years War. Finally, we are at the end game, the final episode. If you haven't watched the episodes before, one through five, stop what you're doing, go ahead, watch those first. The link is in the description down below. While you're there, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing if you haven't yet. You can also hit that notifications bell so you know when my next video is out. Now, let's get into this. <laughs> We left off in 1428, with the English holding most of northern France. They even held the city of Paris itself. The French court had been forced to move to Chenon from Paris, and they were suffering defeat after defeat. It had been six years since their last victory. Charles the Dauphin in France was losing power, and he had nothing to show for all his battles. The English were clearly the dominant power in the area. The Regency Council, headed by the Duke of Bedford, who hold the English powers in France, was looking after the kingdom for his infant king, his nephew. Now in 1428, something truly miraculous happened. While the English were besieging the city of Ullion, a young girl from the Duchy of Bar was at her family's farm. And three years earlier in 1425, she began to have visions of an angel, Saint Michael. She was only 13 years old then. She then had more visions and more visions. And by the age of 16, she broke off a marriage that her father had organized for her and demanded to see the French king. This would set her off on a march from her small farming village to the royal court of Chinon. This person is the one and only heroine of France, Joan of Arc. On her journey to the royal court of Chinon, people began to hear of her visions and began to join her until she had a small band of supporters. And we must remember here, medieval Europe at this point was highly religious and heretics were burnt at the stake. So admitting that she had visions was a dangerous game to play. She could either be believed and accepted or be burnt alive as a heretic. When she arrived at the court, she asked to see the king, but she was denied. Not knowing what to do, she came back another day, told everyone about her visions, and she was denied again. All she wanted to do was help France. Now, Charles the Dauphin of France heard of this teenage girl demanding to see him, and then he heard of her visions. He didn't have much to lose, but he wanted proof that Joan of Arc was actually being visited by angelic beings. So what Charles the Dauphin did is he agreed to let her in on the third time of her visiting, but instead of being on the throne, sitting in regal clothing, he would be in the crowd and hide away from her just to see if she could find him. When Joan was finally let into the court, she went into the big hall and she was met with a sea of faces. Seeing the fake king on the throne didn't deter her. She apparently walked straight up to Charles the Dauphin and said, very illustrious Lord Dauphin, I am come, being sent on the part of God to secure you and your kingdom. Charles, of course, pointed to the actor on the throne and said, I'm not the king, that's the king. Joan looked at him and replied, In God's name, gentle Dauphin, it is you and no other. Now, it doesn't matter if you're religious or not, but we can clearly see that this was proof for Charles and for France, that this young girl was sent by the Almighty himself. Charles was utterly convinced in Joan and he backed her. Joan cut her hair, dressed in plaided armor and mounted a white horse and was shifted off to lead the French forces at the Battle of Ullion. When she arrived there, one of the best commanders in the English forces, the Duke of Salisbury, was struck down by a cannonball. This meant that Joan was extraordinarily confident in her abilities that she had been sent by God. And this gave the armies behind her the confidence to believe in their possible victory. And against all odds, this teenage girl rallied the battle-hardened French troops. You see, the French troops were trapped, but Joan led a surprising attack in shining armor and they beat back the English in a siege. The English were confused by this and they fled in chaos. Then, one at a time, three critical English fortresses fell in Northern France. The French were finally on the attack for the first time in years, and they were being led by a woman. She took them on to find the English might, the English longbow archers. 
She rode them down and destroyed them at the Battle of Pate. The English mystic victory cries fall silent, and the French realize victory may be possible. By 1429, Joan told Charles the Dauphin to follow his birthright and his ancestors and go claim his crown and throne, which he did at the coronation in Notre Dame Cathedral. This was handed to him not because of Charles's brilliance on the battlefield, but because of Joan of Arc's victories and the money Charles used to supply the army. This money came from his wife, Marie d'Anjou, and she got the money from her mother, the Queen Yolanda of Aragon. We have seen many great and powerful men through this series, but they would be nothing if it wasn't for the woman that supported them. On the other side, the English side, the Duke of Bedford watched this happen and there was nothing he could do about it except contain his rage and fury that he was becoming a failure. Joan of Arc was seen as invincible and she turned to Paris itself. But here's where we see her mystical veil being lifted and her momentum being halted. She was shot in the leg with a crossbow and then the siege of Paris failed and she suffered massive casualties. The army then made another unsuccessful attempt on another town in November and December, and Joan was in tatters. At the end of December, Joan returned to the French court, and she learned that she and her family had been ennobled by Charles VII as a reward for her services to him and his kingdom. But this isn't the end of the story for Joan. Unfortunately, she was captured by the Burgundians, who were the Frenchmen that were allied with the English. And for the next years, she was tried and tortured. There was even an instance where her guards took her clothes away and left a man's clothes for her to wear instead, which was against the law. And she was found guilty of heresy because of this and sentenced to death by fire. She burnt at the stake on the 30th of May, 1431, at the tender age of 19. Joan of Arc had been executed by fire but her spirit let the fire the English could not extinguish. From here on out, the English armies were always on the defensive, never the attack. In 1431, the Duke of Bedford even hastily organized a coronation for his nephew, who was now nine years old, as Henry VI, who was now King of France and England. So France had two claims to the French throne, Henry and Charles. Although their English defenses were well organized by the Duke of Bedford, the cost of defending a land in another country was beginning to bleed the English and the Burgundian forces dry. The once heroic Duke of Bedford no longer trusted England's chances of winning. They needed a new plan, and in 1435, an enormous diplomatic summit was called with hundreds of diplomats from France and from England who gathered in front of one power that was above them all, the papacy. Here, England watched as their allies, the Burgundians, and France came to an agreement and made up with each other. And this drove the final nail in the coffin for the English, who had also just learned that the Duke of Bedford, the once powerful regent of France and England, dropped dead. In Westminster, the now 15-year-old Henry VI had decided his minority was over and he wanted the full power of his kingdom without any regency council. Henry was indecisive, he was weak-willed, and he hated war, so he wanted peace with France at any cost. But still, for the next 10 years, under the leadership of the Duke of Suffolk, the War of Attrition dragged on. The English were outnumbered, they were outgunned, and they had no allies. But still, they doggishly held on to the land. King Charles VII of France, with his allies, the Burgundians, couldn't quite gain the English-held lands of Normandy, Maine, and Anjou. The standoff was finally called off with one of the worst treaties ever signed. Like I said, Henry VI of England wanted peace, but he also wanted a bride. And in 1445, it seemed that the Duke of Suffolk had got him both. He went to France and asked Charles VII, the French king, if Henry could marry his cousin, Princess Marie of Anjou. Charles said yes, but the English had to give the lands of Marie and Anjou as the bride price for her hand in marriage. Now this is of course laughable and there was no solid peace agreement between the two parties, but somehow Suffolk and Henry agreed to Charles's terms. 
At first, this was celebrated. London and England finally had a queen and all was well, except no one really understood what had happened until 1447, two years after the signing of the treaty. London was full of refugees from Maine and Anjou, and Charles VII had no new peace proposals for the two parties. And he simply wanted to give back these lands to the English because they were war-torn and destroyed people on the streets of London began to understand that English blood had been spent and shed in vain as their new king had given away all the land his father had won. In 1450, a somewhat pointless battle of Formini took place, seeing the waste of English and French lives. However, it did see the English flee from Normandy, never to return to France. Three years later, in 1453, the last held English lands in France Gascony fell to the French at the Battle of Castillon. The French finally saw a lasting victory, which continues today, except for a few years of occupation from the Germanic countries. After 387 years of Plantagenet and English rule in France, it had all come tumbling down in political chaos. The Duke of Suffolk's enemies had gathered around him and forced him from power. They were angry that he had lost so much French land, and they decapitated him, even though their king, Henry VI, tried to protect him. The king was also attacked in political poetry, and this was completely strange for the time because medieval kings could do no wrong. They were anointed by God, and the clouds of war again gathered as the people who opposed the King Henry's rule gathered around Richard, Duke of York, a descendant of Edward III, and very soon England would be in a bloody civil war that would last for 30 years, the War of the Roses. After years of war, the French had finally won. They had won on the battlefield and they had won in the political game as well. They centralized their kingdom, reducing the powers of the nobles, and would go on to become the abattoir of Europe. However, I think we can also see that the war gave the English people their Englishness. They gained the language. It built a patriotic nation. English was a dirty language used by the peasants and was now a language of culture. It unified a country that would go on to grow in the 16th century. It would eventually turn to the new world in the West and the East. And a few hundred years later, it would become the most powerful nation on earth. I really hope you enjoyed that. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you want to watch in the future. Like, comment, subscribe, the more you know.